Well, hello everyone. It's great to be back with you. Uh, here on the never-ending struggle, as you know, we look at different chapters in Catholic Church history to see where things have been better, where things have been worse, and to see what guidance we can get out of them for living a Catholic life in the present day, which certainly is a very exciting time if it isn't uh, one of the best. Today, we have a very, very important topic and a very contemporary one. That topic, that subject, that person is Blessed Emperor Charles of Habsburg, the last reigning Emperor of Austria and King of Hungary. He was beatified by Pope John Paul II in 2004. And that's sort of interesting because John Paul II, Karol Wojtyla, was named by his father, a very loyal uh, sergeant major in the emperor's army, for reasons we'll explore shortly. Uh, he named him after his emperor. And so in a very strange way, the pope created his own namesake. I've never heard of that happening in the entire history of the church, so enjoy it. The feast that he was given by Pope John Paul II was, in fact, not the day of his death, which was April the 1st, but October 21st, uh, which in real time right now is tomorrow. You'll be seeing this. It'll be two days in the past. But October 21st is uh, the, fee the uh, anniversary of his wedding to Princess Zita of Bourbon Parma, who herself is a servant of God uh, with a cause of beatification all her own. Obviously, if she is beatified, they'll have a joint feast day, which is exactly why it is that Pope John Paul II did it, because one of the things he wanted to point out about the emperor and his wife was the um, tremendous example they were for married couples. Now, Franz Joseph like, had a very unhappy life in many, many ways. And this was part of Carl's story, because, of course, this was the background against which Carl was born. Uh, Carl, uh, Franz Joseph's next uh, younger son, or sorry, next younger brother, I should say, Maximilian, accepted the throne of Mexico and was murdered by Benito Juarez, 1867, which was a great tragedy for his brother. His next brother uh, had two sons, Franz Ferdinand and Otto. But Franz Joseph had a uh, son of his own, Crown Prince Rudolf. And when young Carl was born in 1887, it looked very unlikely that he would ever become the heir to the throne. Very, very unlikely. Because, one, uh, the Crown Prince Rudolf was there, and although he uh, hadn't had a son yet, he had a daughter. Two, Franz Ferdinand hadn't married yet. And then three, uh, but he would probably do so and have children. And so that left uh, left um, Carl very much as the son of the, the spare rather than the heir. Now, Carl had a couple of problems from the very beginning, the biggest of which was that his parents were very poorly suited for each other. His mother, uh, Maria Josefa, was a Saxon princess, very devout, a uh, great lover of the Sacred Heart, all that. But very dour. And her husband, Otto, the father, was a very devil-may-care, gallant, joking, charming kind of fellow. Um, they didn't get on well. And sadly, Otto would end up dying of syphilis because his uh, faithfulness to his wife didn't last. Against this backdrop, however, it's important to bear in mind that, like every other Catholic royal house in Europe, the Habsburgs have their own specific kind of devotion and piety, the so-called Pietas Austriaca, a great deal of devotion to the Eucharist, the Passion, uh, especially the instruments of the Passion, some of which they owned, <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, the Blessed Virgin, and particularly Our Lady of Loretto and the Rosary. And then the um, other newer devotion 
which was really embraced by the family that came along, was the Sacred Heart. And in fact, um, Carl would become known even as a young boy for his devotion to all of these. He accepted the fact that he and his peoples were wed like he and his wife, as was she, and that they could not do anything but live for them, a sort of sacrificial, self-sacrificial leadership. And he risked everything for the good of his people, to include his, uh, his peace attempts, which when they were exposed, gave him all sorts of trouble. Uh, because at that point, it was, oh, well, you see, his heart's not really in the war. Well, it wasn't. He wanted to get out of the war. The war was a terrible thing. Tons of people were dying for no real reason. Uh, he wanted, like his uncle, uh, Franz Ferdinand, to federalize the country. But there wasn't much he could do about that unless the Hungarians agreed because of his coronation oath. Um, as the war went on, Things got tighter and tighter and more difficult. The blockade became tighter. But in all likelihood, they would have survived it had it not been for one man who made himself truly Kaiser Karl's nemesis. That was our very own president, Mr. Woodrow Wilson, who um, hated monarchy, hated the Habsburgs, and hated Catholicism. So, you know, what are you going to do? In time, he made it obvious that there would be no peace until the Habsburgs and the Hohenzollerns were disposed of. Well, that happened. Uh, Winston Churchill, who can't be accused of being too pro-Habsburg or too pro-German, declared that it was precisely Wilson's insistence on this that paved the way for Hitler and Stalin. And I really don't see how you could see it any other way. So in other words, the situation that those of us my age lived with, and really, if you look at what's going on in Ukraine now, has continued to the present, we can thank our dear Mr. Wilson for. Nevertheless, um, Carl refused to abdicate. He withdrew from government, uh, but he refused to abdicate the thrones of either Austria or Hungary. Hungary was taken over in 1920 by a communist government, by, led by a man named Bela Kuhn. It only lasted a few months, but it killed a lot of people. It was pretty dreadful. He was defeated by a man who had been a close friend of the emperor's, Admiral Horthy, who in fact had been his ADC at his wedding. Horthy had always promised that if he had the chance, he would help him get back to power. Well, Karl believed him, and so in March of 1921, threw up real cloak and dagger set of adventures. He got back to Budapest and saw Horthy and said, all right, I'm here. He had assurances from the uh, French prime minister that uh, he would have France's support if he succeeded. Horthy refused and he went back to Switzerland. The Swiss were getting a little suspicious of him. So what he did was he... Um, Tried again <laughs> with Hungary, uh, this time with his wife. They raised an army. They were defeated again through treachery. And this time, the, uh, this time the Allies were not fooling around. Basically, unless Karl and Zita would abdicate their thrones, they would have to leave Europe. So they shipped them off to the lonely island of Madeira. But wait, there was more. They couldn't have any money. Their supporters in Austria and Hungary and elsewhere couldn't sell them anything. What did that mean? Well, it meant they had nothing to live on, really, except what people gave them. They couldn't stay in the hotel in Funchal. They had to move up to a donated summer house up in the hills. It was wet and damp. The Carl had bad lungs because of the 1918 flu and some other things. And in a few weeks of living up there, he caught pneumonia. He lingered and lingered very painfully. He never gave up. He never, never lost his, his sense of good humor, as it were. But sadly, 
he um, he died. When he was dying, of course, he had a, a attending chaplain. He had the uh, the Blessed Sacrament near him and all that. But he said that he was dying, that his, or rather, he said that he was suffering, that his peoples might come back together. You see, it simply was not possible for Carl to do what they wanted any more than he could have divorced his wife. And if it took dying for his peoples to save them, he was willing to do it because he saw his own sovereignty as a participation in the kingship of Christ. And just as Christ died for all mankind, well, Carl died for his peoples. That's a very strange notion for those of us living today. We're used to leaders who don't mind having us die for them, not the other way around. At any rate, one of the odd things that happened the day he died was that he told his wife, well, as soon as I'm dead, contact the king of Spain and he'll take care of you. Uh, she said, how could you say this? Well, I've just spoken to him. You couldn't have spoken to him. I did. Just contact him. Well, there she is, a widow, a child on the way. What could it hurt? She contacts him. He says, the king of Spain, Alfonso XIII, he says, not a problem. I'll send a warship to pick you up. And when the British said they wouldn't let them leave unless she renounced the throne for herself and her children, King Alfonso said, I'm sending a warship to pick them up. If you fire on it, you're at war with Spain. Now, that may not sound like a big deal, but Britain was bled white by World War I, and they backed down from a fight with Turkey the same year. So it wasn't nothing. So they went back to Spain, and uh, when she saw King Alfonso, she asked him, why did you do this? Zita did. Uh, risk war for us. And he said, well, to tell you the truth, when they, the day they told me your husband was dying, I had the sudden feeling that if I didn't take care of you people, the same thing would happen to my wife and children. So they sort of rolled their eyes at each other. Uh, they lived in Spain for eight years, um, where Zita educated her children, brought in various teachers. You could see her as a uh, patroness of uh, homeschooling as well. And then they moved to Belgium. Uh, the Archduke Otto, the oldest boy, uh, attended school in Belgium. Um, but that's a whole other story, how they fled uh, in 1940 from the invading Germans, made their way to uh, the United States and Canada, how Otto worked with FDR and ended up keeping Austria independent, and a lot of other stories like that. We'll save those for another day. What's important for us in the here and now is that Carl, in his manner of death, showed us in his manner of life showed us a way of living like a true cavalier, a true hero in modern days. Uh, you look at his devotion, you look at his chivalrous nature and his chivalrous manner, you would think, this sounds like St. Louis or, or Charlemagne. No. No, he lived in the day of the telegram and the telephone and the railroad and the automobile. He was modern, as was she. And so they uh, can give us very, very good examples of what to be. He is certainly, she po quite possibly uh, is in heaven. Um, and that by itself is enough to lift their lives out of, uh, out of the tragic sphere. But there is a tragedy connected to their story. It's ours. Because, of course, their defeat and the defeat of everything they represented is something that the price has been paid for by every generation that's lived since. Obviously, their enemies didn't really realize what they were doing. Or maybe they did. At any rate, a great deal of the problems we have today come from the fact that they did not succeed in what they tried to do. However. There's a great deal we can glean out, nevertheless. It is interesting to me that the cultus of Kaiser Karl, since uh, his beatification in 2004 by John Paul II, and very speedy second miracle, incidentally, 
which uh, was the miraculous healing of a Baptist lady in Florida who subsequently converted. Um, that That's an interesting thing because as cultures has grown so rapidly in the United States, there are, as of last week, 25 shrines in his honor scattered around the United States. That's quite amazing. Uh, it's amazing that a man who fought the United States was our enemy should um, command such respect, such veneration in our country. And I think the reason is not too hard to discover. Uh, on some level, we yearn for the kind of leadership he represents, for the kind of fatherhood in leadership that he doesn't have. It's one of my little jokes that uh, the United States is the world's longest lived and most successful Oedipus complex. But um, there is a certain amount of truth to that in the sense that we've always been a nation of orphans. And certainly... Well, that is a deep feeling that Kaiser responds to. But there's more. There's much more. As a patron today, when uh, families are so disrupted, when husbands and wives don't see eye to eye and the divorce rate is so high and people don't even know how to be married, they can get married. Being married is something different. Uh, and for that matter, the um, when parents very often don't know what they're doing with their children. In all of these areas, both Carl and Zeta are tremendous examples. He is a tremendous example of the sort of sacrificial leadership, as I say, that we don't have, but that we actually can exercise, those of us who are in any position at all, from father of a family to manager to employer to whatever, we can definitely look to him as an example of what leadership should be.